Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is College Football Pros, and we are very excited today to bring you the first of what we hope is many guests on this podcast. We have the author of Ray of Light, and he is also a noted sports writer. He runs ShanahanReport.com. Mr. Tom Shanahan, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Drew. How are you going today, guys? <laughs> I'm over here, too. <laughs> you sound a little new or nervous, Drew. Is this your first time? It actually is. It's weird. It's nervous talking to a uh, you know noted author as, as we have Tom on the phone here. Yeah, don't give me that much credit. Nah. Uh, Tom, let's just get right into it, sir. Uh, what got you involved in college football in general? Well, uh, we, I actually grew up uh, and was born in Cleveland, and my dad got a job as a professor in a small town called Big Rapids, Michigan, and that's uh, in the center of the Lower Peninsula. And uh, that was about the time Duffy Doherty was put together as powerhouse at Michigan State. So I was immediately a Michigan State fan. That was the first time I really started to follow college football. And um, I always knew there was something unusual about those teams. Uh, Duffy Doherty was way out of the curve as far as recruiting black athletes. And, um, and, then, uh, and then in addition to the large number of black players Michigan State had, they had a black quarterback in Jimmy Ray. So I knew this was unusual, but I was too young to understand the, the social significance of it. But having always uh, loved history throughout my school years, uh, it was a, plant, a seed planted in the back of my head. And uh, once I had a chance to meet Jimmy Ray and make the pitch to him about doing a book, uh, it, it all unfolded from there. Well, what I've seen of the book so far is is deeply enthralling, and it's a, a subject that's still relevant today. I mean, if you've watched the news lately, and I'm sure we all have, you know, there's still a heated racial struggle going on within this country. So it's it's kind of interesting to think about 40 years ago, 50 years ago, this going on, and and someone being such a pioneer. Uh, what exactly prompted you to write this book? Well, I knew there was always uh, something more to, you know, the the the, uh, the old story is that uh, the the pipeline, Duffy Doherty's pipeline to the South, dried up after his great 1966 team. So that was the story that everyone's accepted. But I always thought there had to be something more to it because uh, there were seven black players from the South that Duffy recruited: uh, Barbara Smith and George Webster and Gene Washington, uh, College Hall of Famers among them that were either All-American or All-Big Ten. And uh, I just always thought that was odd. Nobody goes seven for seven in recruiting. And I always wondered how many more black players there were from the South. So once uh, Jimmy and I started to agree to work on this book, one of my goals in the research was to determine exactly how many players uh, Duffy Doherty recruited from the South, black players. Well, it turned out there were 44 from 1959 to his last season in 1972. You know, obviously 44 guys weren't uh, all Americans. So that kind of debunked uh, to me the old, uh, uh, the old comment that uh, Duffy Doherty recruited black players just to win games. He did much more than that. Uh, he gave a lot of these guys uh, not only an opportunity to get to escape the South, but to get an education. Obviously, they weren't all all Americans. They didn't all go on to the NFL. But uh, 68% of them graduated. And for that time frame, that, that's a very high percentage. It's more than the stu- student body for males at, at colleges in general. Uh, and then when you consider that uh, there were no uh, study halls and academic standards like there are now for college athletes, uh, it's a really high number because what happened was in the early 1980s, the graduation rate for black football players had dipped into the 30s. And that's when the uh, NCAA... Uh, started putting all these academic rules. So that shows you how grateful these guys were to uh, not only get a chance to play Big Ten football, but to get an education. Yeah, I mean, I know Drew has some you know thoughts and, and some discussion he wants to have in terms of the, uh, the whole concept of the integration. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Ray wasn't the first uh, black quarterback to win a national championship, wasn't he? I know he didn't technically win one. He had the tie. Uh, with Notre Dame that year, but there was there was there a, a gentleman previous to him that had won a national championship. 
Yeah, there was a guy named Sandy Stevens at Minnesota, and uh, they Minnesota won the national title in 1960. And Sandy was from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and as I kind of reveal in the book and emphasize something that's over been overlooked in in history, as Jimmy Ray is the first black quarterback from the South to win a national title, and uh, and actually I I obviously. As a Michigan State focused book, I emphasize the fact that although the AP and the UPI polls voted Notre Dame number one over Michigan State, uh, the, the National Football Foundation, which awards the MacArthur Bowl, which back in those days was still a pretty prestigious trophy. Uh, nowadays, you don't hear about it because they just automatically give it to whoever wins uh, the BCS or, or now the college football playoff. Well, uh, the National Football Foundation named Michigan State and Notre Dame. Uh, co-national champion, so so that's why Michigan State claims a uh, co a national title for 1966, and, and their explanation was that you know th- these teams were both 9-0 and one on the field, and they played to a 10-10 tie on the field. How do you separate them? So they made them co-national champions. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, the co-national champions, I, I never agreed with, and even from back then, even to today. Um, however, I just want to kind of go back to what you said earlier about. You know, in the mid '60s, that pipeline kind of dried up, started to dry up. Do you think, you know, it, it took the SEC schools and the Alabamas of the world to the early '70s to integrate? But do you think Michigan State and the coaching staff there really opened up the eyes of these schools in the South? Absolutely, that's exactly what happened. Is uh, uh, not only the South, but uh, in the North, uh, in the Midwest, and in other parts of the country too. Uh, and here's the perfect example. Uh, you know, back in those days, they generally didn't uh, recruit black athletes because if your whole coaching staff is white, well, then all the people you know in recruiting networks are white high schools. You don't know the black high schools. And also, they generally didn't uh, trust black athletes. They didn't think they were smart. They couldn't play quarterback, couldn't make signals at middle linebacker. So there just wasn't much emphasis on recruiting black athletes. And the perfect example of how Michigan State kind of knocked down that door is 19, uh, USC has had a long history of integration, but their 19, 1967 national championship team had only seven black players. And you compare that to Michigan State, their 65 and 66 teams had 20 black players, which is nothing now, but, but, but back then it was an unheard of number. And uh, you can tell just by comparing 20 to USC in 1967. Well, uh, the next time USC won a national title was 1972, and by then they had had 23 black players on their roster. So you can see from there that that Duffy Doherty and his Michigan State teams had started to knock down a lot of the uh, stereotypes and uh, whatever reasons were holding back uh, coaches from looking more closely for black athletes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really amazing when you're not exposed to this type of, of behavior and you are living in a time, at least when I was growing up, where, you know, racial tensions had, had seemingly settled. It, it You don't really think, you're a little bit naive, I guess, to think about the struggle that, that went on for, for the black college players to gain acceptance. And then in reading the first, you know, little bits of this book, it's really amazing to see just how important this program was in regards to the recruiting process and really fully opening up the doors and and making not even you know cause not helping to but forcibly making the other schools see you know what they really needed to be doing in terms of recruitment and more than that opportunity and it's just amazing to me that this you know so much of this class how successful they were i mean i've never heard of a situation where four of the first eight players in the 67 draft were from this team including bubba smith and and bubba smith uh if if you know just a little background on me i've really only been watching college football for about three years but i mean i've been a diehard since then but bubba smith was my first exposure to college football would you like to guess Uh why why? Because he was Lieutenant Hightower in the police academy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I saw him, and he was such a big, intimidating, imposing guy. And I remember asking my grandfather, "Who is this guy?" You know, he doesn't look like he—he he wasn't a big name actor. I hadn't seen him on other things. Where I'd seen some of the other police academy guys, and my grandpa was able to tell me 
uh, you know, exactly how powerful of a player he was. And, I, and I've heard, you know, I've read so many stories about how he was actually just such a character. Yeah, he was. And uh, both uh, Bubba and George Webster uh, uh, had uh, injuries in the NFL early in their career, or else they would have ended up in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. They were great players. But, yeah, like you said, uh, you know, uh, guys like Jimmy Ray, you know, Bubba and George Webster are, de- are deceased, but Jimmy Ray's still around, and Gene Washington, the Alpha and All-American who was from the Houston era. These guys grew up in segregation, and uh, people think it's ancient history. Well, these guys are still walking around. And, and as Jimmy Ray says, you know, he coached in the NFL for a long time. Uh, not only do uh, black and white kids not quite understand how recent was segregation, some of the younger coaches in the NFL don't realize it. So uh, that's something I hope to, uh, I, I hope continues uh, to uh, my book helps uh, gain more awareness of. Yeah, in a situation in today's day and age, I, the one question I did want to ask is, do you feel that we're more, in today's society, are we more like we were back in the 60s when it comes to segregation and everything you see in the news, or do you think we're starting to move maybe away from that? Any thoughts on that? Well, here's what I think. You know, we still have a long way to go, and, and uh, the, the recent controversy in uh, South Carolina, not only the murders, but then the, the, the debate that prompted afterwards about bringing down the Confederate flags. Um, you know, back in the 60s, uh, high-profile coaches like Bear Bryant at Alabama didn't say anything about uh, against segregation. They just were happy to live the way it was. And now you have football coaches like Steve Spurrier in South Carolina and uh, Dabo uh, Sweeney at Clemson, the two coaches uh, in the state of South Carolina that will get asked about it the most. And they're standing up and saying out loud, you know, that this is, should, have been, should have happened a long time ago. So uh, that's a sign of progress that uh, uh, people aren't just remaining silent. People that can do something are just remaining silent, and that's what Bear Bryant did. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King, when he was first organizing a lot of the, uh, the civil rights movements, uh, I know in one, there's one speech uh, I've re- re- referred to in 1958 uh, in Raleigh, in North Carolina, where he spoke to a church, and he said that there are a lot more white people in the South that are against segregation but they aren't standing up and doing something about it. So we're long past that phase where people just kind of silently watched and let all these atrocious things happen. And now uh, people, uh, uh, people are standing up and doing the right thing, even though we still have a lot of uh, Neanderthals out there. Yeah, I got to just echo a sentiment. It's not often that I'll, you know, go social and political on these shows um, because that's really not what we're about. We're about college football, and it shouldn't be, you know, about anything other than that. But really, you made such a good point that people back then were not in support of segregation, but they failed to really do anything about it they didn't want to stand up and be help be part of the solution they were fine with just sitting there and, and whether they realize it or not being part of the problem and i still see so much of that happening today like words are thrown out i mean we have social media so you basically can't walk down the hallway without somebody in every country in the world knowing what you're doing if you want them to yet we're still more of a society of words than we are of action and it takes people like Duffy, who are willing to say, okay, I don't believe in this, but not only do I not believe in this, I'm going to do something about this. And we could see the result that came of that. I mean, if people are are sometimes, I think, just so confused about history, it, it can be used as an example. There are good cause and effect relationships that you can use from the past like we saw with Duffy and Michigan State to apply to where we're at now and truthfully the result probably wouldn't be too much different right and uh, a good example of that I was able to interview Jesse Jackson for the book and Jesse Jackson uh, was from South Carolina and he went to Illinois briefly to play football and uh, then he transferred and left and played at North Carolina A&T so he was from he was from the south in the 50s and uh, we were talking about the Michigan State teams and their role 
uh, in the civil rights movement. And what Jesse Jackson said was, even though guys like Bubba Smith and Jimmy Ray and George Webster weren't out there protesting, just being seen on TV and uh, in newspapers and in magazines, they were making a difference because people who otherwise weren't exposed to black people were seeing what they were doing, that they were good athletes and they were good people. And uh, they just, it just it changes the whole picture of uh, people's attitudes if they, if they interact more with uh, different people, different uh, people of different races. Yeah, and that's actually a good uh, good segue into what I was going to ask next. You know, how when Coach Duffy went down to Beaumont, Texas, you know, to Laporte, Texas, you know, to South Carolina to recruit these guys, how was he accepted with the community members, and how did other you know parents or other players how did they react to him? Did he have any ill will towards him? Well, here was the other thing that uh, I was real happy I was able to find from my research, because like I said, people have no idea how vast uh, Duffy's recruiting network was in the South. Uh, uh, Minnesota, like I mentioned, Minnesota and Sandy Stevens earlier from Pennsylvania. The Minnesota coach, uh, Murray Warmoth, had a few black players from the South, Carl Eller and Bobby Bell, but those were all anecdotal. He knew somebody who knew somebody. Duffy actually had a network, and the way it developed... And, and this is something else that had never been written until uh, I was able to uh, research it for my book. What happened was in the late 50s when he first started to gain national prominence, uh, he would go around the country to, to uh, he was invited to go around the country and speak at clinics. And he went to Atlanta and he was disturbed that uh, the black high school coaches weren't allowed to attend. So what he did on his own is, uh, you know, he fulfilled his obligation and then he put on a clinic just for the black high school coaches. Well, then he started to gain a reputation among these black high school coaches. And Duffy always enjoyed the coaching fraternity. He enjoyed clinics. And eventually he started putting on a special clinic, uh, and the black high school coaches from the south would drive up to Michigan State. And so uh, he, he not only built up a friendship with them, but a, a trust that if these guys sent their players up to Michigan State, Duffy was going to take care of them. So that was where his rec- recruiting network began. Uh, it included, it included uh, Bubba Smith's father. He was a uh, very successful coach in Beaumont, Texas, in the Houston area, and uh, he he sent he sent uh, his son up to play for Duffy. Well, at, uh, this whole concept, this whole discussion, just gets me so excited. Uh, I'm a longtime wrestling fan. I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing. I get a different reaction from everybody I say that to. But real one, wrestling or the real wrestling or the pro wrestling? Pro wrestling, but pro it's, still, wrestling. it's still real to me. <laughs> Hair. All right, all right. <laughs> but uh, you know, when I became infatuated with that when I was younger. You know, I just wanted to dig up all the history and know everything about everyone that had been involved um, with it. And I find myself, you know, 30 years later in the same position with college football where, you know, number one, I wasn't alive when this happened, but I have never really heard a lot of these stories and wasn't exposed to how how vital this, this time and this specific coach was in college football. So it's really exciting to me. But one thing I do know is that, the game of the century 10-10 tie was a a highly controversial and still talked about game today. I mean, I'm not really familiar with with how it was back then, but in a big game situation like that, why didn't they play any further? Why were they just fine with allowing it to be a tie? Well, that's one of the rules of war back then. You can never have a game like that. Uh, there was no overtime, and uh, because of the way the polls work, were. Uh, you, where the sports writers uh, voted for the AP poll and the coaches for the UPI poll, Eric Partizan uh, decided that uh, he wasn't going to risk throwing the ball in the fourth quarter uh, with the score tied. And it was actually Michigan State on defense calling timeout, trying to get the ball back. And, uh, and Eric Partizan's uh, comment was that, uh, uh, you know, they, they were ranked number one and they were got a tie on the road, and he, he banked on the... Uh, the poll voters leaving them number one, and that's what happened. Uh, now, of course, you've get, you, you have overtime, you have you have uh, before the BCS, and now the college football playoffs. So there'll never be a game like that again. 
Yeah, uh, and I, I think one of the other interesting parts of this conversation, we've talked a lot about Duffy and his influence in, in the whole segregation movie, but the book is actually called Ray of Light behind the name Jimmy Ray. Do you want to go into a little bit of discussion about you know why he was so vital to the segregation process or the integration process rather and 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 didn't he wasn't he involved overall between coaching and playing around 40 years yeah yeah uh you know i write in the book that bubba smith is uh uh, the most famous of the underground railroad passengers and it's kind of funny you mentioned the euro story because when i would do research uh I was at the uh, National Archives in Washington, D.C., and I had a woman helping me look up stories, and and, uh, uh, and I mentioned the name Bubba Smith to her, and she, I had a, got a blank look from her, and I said, you know the Police Academy movies, right? And she goes, oh, I know who you mean now. <laughs> but anyways, uh, Bubba Smith is the most famous of the Underground Railroad players, but Jimmy Ray is the most socially significant. And the reason for that is he was a black quarterback when there were no black quarterbacks. And then he went on and coached in college in the NFL. When he first, uh, Duffy Doherty hired both Jimmy Ray and Sherman Lewis, who uh, was a running back for him in the early 60s out of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, on his staff. And uh, they were two of the first black coaches in college football. And then they both moved on to the NFL. But when Jimmy went on to the NFL with the San Francisco 49ers, in 1977, there were only three other black coaches in the entire league of 28 teams. So think about how much uh, it's changed since then. And that, that's all just a step-by-step process of, okay, we finally had a black quarterback. Now that now, uh, uh, now there's more black quarterbacks when there used to be only one or two. We now have more black coaches, not only head coaches, but assistant coaches when there are only uh, a handful of assistants and no head coaches. So, you know, in, in all cases, we always have farther to go. There's a, a, still more progress to be made. But uh, when you think about it in those terms, we've come a long way. Yeah, we absolutely have. And, you know, I'm, I'm 29 years old, so obviously I wasn't alive for the situation. But I remember growing up, and I remember my father obviously telling me about Bubba Smith because he's a, he's a legend in his own right. But yeah, I guess was- – I was just going to say he was a character. Go ahead. Yeah, no, and that's what I was just going to say. You know, it, he's this big, intimidating guy on the football field. But everything that I've read, everything that I've heard, kind of what Nick said earlier about the Police Academy movies, you know, he was a, he was a, you know, he's the big teddy bear, you know, and right. they, they said he had the, you know, he was the biggest hearted guy, you know, on that team and everything. And what it's kind of, why, why do you think, I mean, I, I don't want to rehash an old question, but, I don't know if you went to the casual football fan or even a hardcore football fan, why isn't this story talked about more? Uh, just generation, you know, uh, uh, people only know what's on TV right now. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's just, uh, something that's been lost a little bit to history and, uh, not everybody uh, cares about what happened in the past. They're only worried about uh, today. So, Hopefully, you know, uh, we've done real good with a, real well with a book uh, in Michigan, and then uh, Jimmy Ray and I had a, uh, a couple of good book signings down here in North Carolina, where he's from, Fayetteville, North Carolina. But we're still hoping that someone like ESPN and some of the national networks will recognize uh, what a great story this is, that, what a great untold story this is. And uh, I'm hoping that maybe with the 50th anniversary of their 65 championship and then next year the 66 game of the century that uh, that'll that'll come about do you know if michigan state is planning on honoring anybody or bringing anybody back that may still be alive well uh, uh they had four you know you talked about the four guys that were drafted among the first eight picks in the nfl uh Bob smith was number one by the baltimore colts and Bubba's passed away clinton jones was number two he was a uh, two-time all-american halfback for the Spartans. Uh, he was t- number two by the Minnesota Vikings. George Webster uh, was uh, number five by the Houston Oilers. And then Gene Washington, uh, George was a linebacker. Gene Washington was a uh, end or wide receiver. He was number eight by the Minnesota Vikings. So Bubba and George have both passed away, but Clinton Jones and Gene Washington are still alive. Uh, Bubba and uh, 
George went into the College Football Hall of Fame in the 80s. Gene Washington went in in 2011. And now Clinton Jones is going in this year, 2015. The uh, ceremony is in New York in December. But on September 12th, when Michigan State uh, plays Oregon at Spartan Stadium, which will be obviously be a big game, um, as a new Hall of Fame member, he'll get his name added to uh, the Ring of Fame at Spartan Stadium. And then October 3rd, when Michigan State plays on its homecoming game against Purdue, they're going to have a 50th anniversary for the 65 team. Wow, that's that's awesome. I I would really hope that ESPN could pick up on something like this because they've done numerous 30 for 30 uh, you know, shows. And Drew and I actually went to the one about Maurice Claret. He did a uh, charity basketball game locally here. We're in the Youngstown area, so Trestle and uh, Claret are around here. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to get my hands on this book. I mean, I, I, I can't wait – to uh, to be able to like just dedicate some time over the next couple of days when Drew goes on vacation and I I don't have that headache anymore to deal with <laughs> wow. and uh, <laughs> you know I love you Drew I got your back but uh, in addition to writing the book you also have the Shanahan Report dot com do you want to talk a little bit about that Well I kind of started that site to help promote my book and then write about other things I'd like to write on. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, one of the things that I was doing a few years ago was covering Army football for the Rivals.com network. Mm. And uh, it was something I enjoyed a lot more than I expected because uh, uh, the athletes, uh, they're, just, they're just such great guys. They're, you, know, you don't get any of that sense of entitlement that you have the problems with a lot of the major college athletes today. And, uh, you know, these are, uh, these are guys that all... Have, you know, going you know, going to college to play football, but also going to have to serve five years in the military in a time when it's uh, you know a very dangerous world. And, uh, and I actually, in one of my stories, of, I quoted Stanford coach David Shaw before they played Army, and uh, he was talking about his respect for the Army players and how he educated his Stanford players about it. And he said, "These are guys willing to do things that the rest of us don't want to do." You know, that's quite a statement, and it's true. And uh, the other thing that I, I found really interesting about it is I'm old enough, I'm not old enough to have gone to Vietnam, but I'm old enough to have gone to remember all the protests and how people were trying to stay out of the military. And now it's, it's come 180, uh, especially uh, in response to 9-11. That's what I found out from talking to a lot of these kids, is they want to serve their country. So I'm pretty fascinated about that contrast. And I thought about uh, using my website not only for all my Michigan State stories, but uh, as a uh, as a story about Army and Navy and Air Force uh, football or sports. And then I was going to donate some of the proceeds to the Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, and everybody told me it was a great idea. <laughs> but I, I, when I started to try and enact it, I found out it. The uh, nonprofit rules are very complicated and uh, maybe too expensive for me to set up. So I've kind of put that plan on hold unless I can figure out another way to do it. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, the Armed Forces branch, and, and, and I don't remember if Drew and I were talking about this on air or not, but literally no more than a week ago was I just telling him that if I could go to one college football game, the Army-Navy game is one I want to go see. Yeah, and uh, it's a game you have to see. You can't explain to somebody. Uh, that was part of the reason I got involved covering Army football for rivals, is I didn't want to just go to the game. I wanted to uh, have a credential. I've, I've been a sports writer too long. I get bored sitting in the stands. <laughs> I need to be working to keep uh, my mind occupied. But anyways, uh, when I went to my first game, it was. Uh, I always tell people, you know, it's kind of like, when you go, when people tell you that a movie's great, and then you go see the movie, and they say, "Well, it was good, but it wasn't that great." Well, the Army Navy game uh, lives up to all of its uh, build up and more. Yeah, so that's I definitely think in my lifetime, I'm I'm a I'm not only am I a homebody, but I do a lot of daily fantasy. Are you familiar with that yet? The uh, fantasy football, you mean? Yeah, but it's done on like a, a, a. It's called daily fantasy because you don't have a season long commitment. It's it's. Oh. And so and, I do uh, a lot. 
I do a lot of that, and uh, I, I just like watching the games at home, so I'm kind of adverse yeah. to, to going to them. But, it, it, you know, I definitely want to see that. Our discussion overall kind of t- runs in perfectly with, with the subject matter we're going to cover over the next uh, two episodes on our podcast, and, uh, and that's the Big Ten. I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about Duffy and Jimmy Ray and, and Bubba, uh, Bubba Smith and all that, but we're also talking about Michigan State football. So I guess to kind of close out the show a little bit here, do you want to just give us some of your thoughts on the Big Ten this year? Well, I think it's uh, the Big Ten has come back a long ways. A lot of people give uh, Urban Meyer the credit, and he's got the national title to show for it. There's no doubt about that. But the other programs have been building up for a while. You know, obviously Michigan State, Mark D'Antonio, uh, has done a, has done great things. The program has never been in better shape since the Duffy Doherty years. So, uh, so there's that example of Mark D'Antonio steadily building up the program over the last seven years he's been in there that they could compete with all the SEC and uh, Pac-12 schools, that type of thing. Now, Wisconsin's been steady for a while. Uh, Penn State had kind of leveled off when Joe Paterno, Joe Paterno had gotten pretty old. You know, there's stories about how he couldn't remember players' names, and he wasn't really coaching the team anymore. So I think you'll see Penn State uh, be another Big Ten team that <clears throat> excuse me, rises up to that uh, national level. And then uh, Jim Harbaugh will get them up to a national – Michigan will get, up, get Michigan up to a national level for a while. The question remains on how long he can hold it because – of his reputation for uh, burning out his players uh, and rubbing people the wrong way. But he'll definitely get them back up there. So you look at that Big Ten East, Ohio State, Michigan State, Michigan, Penn State. How are you going to get through that division without losing at least one game? It's going to be amazing football. Yeah, and I think you know we'll, we're going to get into it in our next episode. I, Ohio State, to me, is the best team in the country coming into the year. I feel like it's cheating, but they've just returned so much. But like you said, I mean, Michigan State has has such a great defense, and, and Connor Cook is really coming into his own as a quarterback. And Penn State, the, the same thing. I think last year, you know, for all the hype I hear about Christian Hackenberg, he just didn't look it last year. But they had horrible production from the running game, and I don't see that happening this year. And, and Penn State, the two games on the Ohio State schedule that, that give me alert would be Michigan State and Penn State. Right. And then on the other side of it, as far as the Big Ten, uh, I don't think you'll see Nebraska ever be the power it was again. And the reason being is they were kind of ahead of the curve as far as recruiting nationally and spending a lot of money. You know, Tom Osborne used to helicopter into high school campuses and, and you know, and do flashy things like that would, that would catch kids' attention. And you can't really get away with that stuff anymore. Uh, so I don't, and so uh, uh, I don't think kids are going to go to Nebraska to play football because it's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, a lot of those kids came from New Jersey, and, uh, you know, Michigan State's got New Jersey players, Penn State does. Uh, I just don't think you'll ever see Nebraska return to the stature they were. Yeah, yeah in this day and age with national recruiting, yeah, I mean, with the social medias and the ESPNs were with recruiting specials on every day, you know, before, especially when guys like Duffy were coaching and, you know, Woody was coaching at Ohio State, you know, you pretty much stayed – you know, in your states for the majority of your players, obviously what we're talking about here and Duffy going down South recruiting, but you know, in this day yeah. and age, I, I don't know if a team that's going to be able to just be dominant, you know, in their home yeah. state, it's going to be very hard. Yeah. And that's why, you know, it was too bad what happened to Bo Pelini because they were trying to measure him to uh, Tom Osborne. And uh, I just don't think, uh, uh, you know, Nebraska didn't win a big 10 title or anything like that. They got to the conference championship game, but I don't think you're going to see uh, Mike Riley or other coaches do uh, much better or, or even equal what Bo Pelini did. Yeah, I mean, Nebraska's loss is uh, Youngstown State's gain, which is where we're from, the Youngstown area. So, you know, he comes on right. board with, you know, Coach Trussell as the president. So, you know, for us, we right. couldn't be happier that he got fired, if that makes sense. <laughs> right. So, but, but that's the sports world. Uh, fans of schools like Nebraska uh, are unrealistic. Just like, uh, you know, they, uh, 
they were pretty upset at Ohio State for a while there when they had to settle for a six and six season, and then um, yeah, well, Michigan Brady Hoke was a big mystery to me. I thought he would do a lot better than he did, and uh, you know the Michigan fans uh, didn't back him anymore. But of course, he wasn't winning at the end there either. So. But it used to be a coach. A coach would have five, six, seven years to turn around a program. Now it's only two or three, and especially in a program like Nebraska or Michigan, type those type of places. Well, that speaks absolutely to our culture. We're a, an instant gratification culture these days. So if you can't get it done with uh, the first couple of years, trust me, we live in Youngstown, as we've said multiple times, and we've seen the Cleveland Browns cycle in a coaching staff two years for the past you know, 17 years since they've been back, so... Right, yeah. right. It carries over to the NFL, too, right. Absolutely. Well, Tom, it has been great um, being able to talk to you about your book and, and, and talk to you about football. Is there anything else you want to add? Where can we find your book for those interested in purchasing? Uh, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and then you can go to my website, uh, and uh, there's a link to the publisher, and he'll, he has a free mailing for it. So uh, those are the places you can go. Well, it has been awesome, and you can find us on Facebook at College Football Pros, on Twitter at CFB Pros, and online at www.cfbpros.com. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you next time.